<laughs> so it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Pavel. I'm not going to try this That's again. okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> Pavel and Zach um, from UW are visiting today and tomorrow. Um, Pavel is going to give the first talk. There's going to be a second, slightly more specific talk this afternoon, uh, upstairs in 422. Um, but I was told that I should introduce Pavel by saying that he's working on two types of floats. Um, <laughs> one, the floats that you know from CSS and HTML, and one on the floating point <laughs> arithmetic, and it's the second one he's going to talk about today. So without further ado, the is yours. All right, thanks. Yeah, so I'll be talking about one of my two float-related hobbies, uh, but I guess uh, we can talk about the others offline if you're interested. So in particular, um, I want to talk about some of the work that I've been doing at the University of Washington on floats that can be broadly summarized as building numerical methods tools, but for people who aren't numerical methods experts. And sort of the core motivation for why we want to do this uh, goes back to floating point arithmetic itself. So floating point arithmetic has been a huge success. And the ways in which it has been a success is that it has provided almost all programmers on pretty much any platform, pretty much any CPU, access to very accurate arithmetic operations. And I don't just mean the built-in operations like addition and subtraction, but also freely available accurate libraries for things like tangent and sine and cosine. And furthermore, not only is floating point fairly accurate, but, oh no, uh, it is also quite flexible. So floating point numbers, this single abstraction, provides this vast range of values that you can compute over, pretty much all values that you would regularly run into in the course of doing some real world computation. So you can use floating point no matter what domain you're working in. And lastly, both this accuracy and this flexibility comes very cheap. So you can get a lot of computational power out of even the simplest chips. Your cell phone, even Internet of Things devices now sometimes have floating point hardware in them that can do floating point operations quite quickly. And because floating point arithmetic makes it easy, accurate, and cheap to do mathematical computations, we found floating point arithmetic and numerical software permeating all aspects of our lives. So from health, electricity, financial trading, transport, logistics, and you know it's even going to take us to space one day. Uh, and all of these advances have been possible because it is so easy to write numerical software, because such a wide array of programmers can use floating point arithmetic to do something useful. But of course, this easy accessibility and this you know, uh, low barrier to entry has also brought with it challenges. And we've known about these challenges for decades. Uh, Kahan wrote in 1983 that computations that used to require experts like him to do are now something that a programmer can pull a library off the shelf and use. That means that there's a lot more users of floating point arithmetic, but also that these users have less expertise. These users have not maybe had formal numerical methods training. They might not be able to do a backwards error analysis to determine the stability of their algorithm uh, or prove error bounds on their computation. And not only has this problem already been ongoing for 30 years, but there's good reason to think that it will continue uh, with things like robotics, with automated cars, with artificial intelligence. We're seeing more and more use of numerical computations, things like optimization, matrix operations, etc., in what we traditionally might not think of as numeric domains. But even as we're getting more use for numerical software, we are not necessarily getting more numerical methods experts. It's no longer a class that's too commonly taught, for example, uh, and it's hard enough finding people who are experts in artificial intelligence, let alone asking that they also be experts in numerical methods. So sort of this confluence of trends, the ease of using floating point software, the widespread domains in which it's used in, also means that it is important to work on numerical tools for people who don't know that much about numerical methods. So that's fundamentally the motivation for our work. And to make this a little more concrete, I want to talk about two of the projects that we've done at the University of Washington 
broadly aimed at this problem. The first one's called Herbgrind. And the goal of that is to do root cause analysis for floating point errors that occur in large programs. And the second project I'll talk about is Herbie. And the goal of that is to automatically improve individual floating point formulas that have error. So I'll describe both projects in some technical detail. And then I'm going to try to pop back up and talk about some of the things we've learned doing both projects. So some lessons we've learned, uh, places where decisions have to be made, and maybe some, some tips and tricks that could be useful outside of our two tools. So I'll start with Herbgrind. And really the motivation for Herbgrind goes back to a common problem that people have uh, if they are writing numerical software and are not numerical methods experts, which is that as a non-expert, it is hard to figure out what the problem actually is. A numerical methods non-expert can tell that something has gone wrong because, say, there's a value that should be positive but, in fact, is computed to be negative, or a, they're dividing by something that should be non-zero but, in fact, is computed to be zero, something like that. So they can detect that this problem has occurred, but identifying the floating point cause of that, whether it's cancellation or round off or something like that, uh, determining the root cause, so finding where in the program that inaccuracy was introduced, and determining what context around that operation they need to improve the error, that's something that's difficult to do without some expertise. Basically, you need to have solved lots of these problems in the past to know what sort of information you'll need to solve this one. The fact that this information is hard to gather and hard to identify not only means that the user themselves can't solve the problem, it also means that they can't easily get help from experts, and they can't apply tools that you know, we in the software engineering world are developing to help them. So it's really a root problem for a lot of the work that we like to do, helping non-expert users write in our software. And, and of course, helping non-expert users is good, but there's probably some value that expert users can get out of this as well, even if that's just helping with the simplest cases. So let me give you uh, an example of the sorts of problems that come up, just so it's a little more concrete. So here are four lines of code. Uh, the first two define a function called foo, which computes some sort of weird formula based on two points. And the second function called bar calls foo, using some particular input values. Now if you write down these two, formula, these two functions, you can test them individually and conclude that both are quite accurate, uh, independently. But when used together like this, bar and foo, you find that for certain input values, you get inaccurate answers. So for example, if bar is called such that x is a lot larger than y and z, you'll find that you get an output of 0, even though the output should be something like 1 minus 0 times 10 to the 16. So very much not 0. Uh, and not only is this you know, an odd situation, uh, maybe you're planning to divide by this. It should be not 0, but it is 0. Uh, you also have some challenging, you might even call them philosophical questions. Like, uh, which of these two functions is to blame? Foo is quite accurate on almost all input values, and you can't really do better. Uh, bar doesn't even do floating point computations, so how could it be at fault? Even if you resolve this question of where you need to introduce a fix, what information do you need to develop that fix? Do you need to know about just foo, about bar, their relationship, their caller, perhaps? And of course, I've been talking about four lines of code, but your first step in any of this is going to be to identify these four lines of code out of a collection of 10 or 100,000 lines of code. And goodness knows, the way numerical software works, that could be 100,000 lines of mixed MATLAB, Fortran, and C. So good luck. But isn't the problem here the color of, of bar? Yeah. So, sorry, the bar calls foo here. Uh, but you can imagine this being an excerpt of a much larger program. Yeah, well, what I'm saying is that neither foo and, uh, foo and bar can be, I mean, we, we, we can neither say that foo or bar are, are, are floating. The, 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 the floating guy is actually the guy who could buy the code, the bar. Sure, because, sure. Because they could it with, with a value which is too large. Yep, and so determining where exactly you want to introduce a fix, like you're pointing out, is challenging. You might need additional context from why we're calling it with these input values. 
Or perhaps you could replace bar to not call foo at all and do some more accurate computation. So I think in this case that's possible. Okay, so uh, these are the sorts of challenges that come up. And with Herb Grind, our goal is to solve them automatically for the user without asking too many questions. And in particular, we want to focus on these three challenges that came up in this previous slide, which is that floating point errors are hard to find because, first of all, you don't get an exception when floating point inaccuracy occurs. You just get a, a confusing answer out at the end. Uh, floating point errors are non-local. So the cause of the error, the operation that introduces inaccuracy, could be quite far from the program output that is printed to the screen that happens to be inaccurate or the, the value that should be positive that is computed to be negative or whatnot. And finally, they're non-compositional. So uh, even if you have independent functions that are quite accurate on their own, composing them might lead to problems, like they did for foo and bar. So Herbgrind basically is three subsystems, one aimed at each of these problems. And what I'm going to do in this talk is give you all three of these subsystems and step through how we solve these three problems. And eventually, uh, by combining those together, we can give output to the user that's helpful to them to solve the problem. So I'm going to present these three subsystems on this simplified floating point machine. So you can imagine for now that we have just a stream of instructions. And each of these instructions reads values from registers computes a single floating point operation on them, like addition or sign or whatever, uh, and stores the result back into memory. So execution proceeds just by mutating memory step by step. So our first challenge is that this memory, which stores floating point values, doesn't give us any indication when the floating point values it stores are inaccurate. So our first challenge is to solve that. And we're going to solve that by introducing a higher precision shadow value. So off in memory, to the side of the normal floating point values, we're going to have some form of higher precision floating point values, one for each memory location. And if we keep track of this additional information, we can point to any cell in memory and ask it how accurate is this value by comparing its shadow higher precision value. Okay? And to maintain this information, we're going to you know, initialize memory to contain the same high precision, low precision values, and then with each, with each operation, we execute an analog to that operation in higher precision on the high precision inputs to get a high precision output. Okay, now on its own, this information allows us to pick a value in memory and ask how inaccurate is it after all the computation that's happened to it. But what we actually want to detect are individual operations that introduce new error. Because intuitively, we know that most floating point operations at least propagate erroneous inputs to erroneous outputs, sort of a garbage in, garbage out property. So to do that, we use this heuristic uh, that we developed and the project will tell you about later, Herbie, called local error. Here's the idea behind how that works. Using these high precision shadow values, we can compute what the correct value for any cell in memory would be. And that's by just doing the, the operation in high precision and rounding that result to the lower precision value. We're going to want to compare this ground truth or correct value to a value that we compute by doing the operation in lower precision on inputs that are rounded versions of the high precision values. So this is a little weird. We're not comparing the high precision output to the low precision output that the program actually computes. That's just the overall error in the entire chain of computation that, that's led to that point. Instead, we're doing an individual floating point operation with exactly computed inputs. So that ensures that we're blaming this operation only for errors that it introduces into its output, not errors that previous operations introduced into its inputs. Does that make sense? Isn't it potentially a problem here that maybe the error behavior of the operation is very different when working on these values drawn by rounding the precise values rather than computing on the actual already imprecise values? Could right, definitely. So uh, in effect, what you're saying is that the values that we see here aren't actually any values that the, the pure floating point computation would run into. And so its error behavior might be different. 
And the point of this heuristic is that we're, we are testing a hypothetical. And namely, the hypothetical you might imagine testing is imagine if the whole program were correct and no other errors were introduced before this point. Would this operation itself still cause problems? So those are the operations that we want to specially track. How does that now differ from the definition of a floating point operation in IEEE? So the definition of a floating point operation yeah. would start with floating point values and require that you produce the most exact output possible. And really the key here that causes the difference is this rounding from high precision to low precision. So you can see here that the high precision value might be 10 to the 12th plus one and 10 to the 12th. So in high precision, if you don't round them first, you can compute an accurate answer. But if you round them first, you lose key information. It's because you're doing this operation, admittedly accurately in lower precision, that you're introducing error. What do you mean by high precision? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, so in Herbgrind, we use MPFR to do arbitrary precision computations for a high precision. So you can think of this as 2,000 bit floating point. It's still a floating point number. It's still a floating point number, but 2,000 bits is a lot of bits. <laughs> so what I'm confused about is, isn't it still possible that there's no uh, one operation that is, that is causing a problem on its own? It's just yeah, so it is true that uh, you could just have an accumulation of many small rounding errors. What we've generally found is that those are a small fraction of the errors that people run into. And I'll talk about this more a little later so we can get back to that. You can also set a threshold for what you consider to be uh, an error. So if, if you sort of do the analysis with a high threshold and it doesn't turn anything up, you can sort of go down as low as you want. Uh, you can make the analysis more and more sensitive. So Eventually it will error, pick up on rounding errors. Yeah. Okay, so uh, this is a heuristic we use to identify individual operations. And here's how we're gonna use that heuristic. We start with our floating memory and the higher precision shadow values. And using local error, we can identify individual operations that have computed a value into memory that where we think local error is introduced. So you can think of this value as being marked as produced by a locally erroneous computation. And then when future operations like this one, oh goodness, when future operations like this one use that value, we're gonna add a mark to that value as well, pointing back to the originally erroneous instruction. So you can think of this as basically a taint analysis where we introduce new taints anytime high local error occurs and then track them throughout the computation. So this is assuming this, this um, garbage in garbage out property of, of uh, versions. But sometimes, um, I mean, uh, numerical algorithms are designed in a robust way so that you can actually uh, give them wrong values and they will uh, compute good values. That's a, that's a great point. So actually, we have some tricks uh, thrown into this taint analysis to identify some of those situations. So for example, one of the tricks is that uh, if the exact value of one of the inputs is zero, and a lot of algorithms uh, will do this trick where the exact value ought to be zero, but it's actually computed to be some sort of offset to error in another value. So uh, we have some idioms thrown into, in those cases, uh, toss out certain parts of the taint. So you could say, oh, you know, that value which we think is a compensating term, don't include all of the taints from it in my output. So. Uh, this is a pretty flexible mechanism where we can throw in some tricks like that. And we've got, you know, uh, we've looked at some like award-winning numerical software where we can correctly ignore most of these double-double idioms. Okay, so uh, between these two subsystems, the high precision memory and this influence tracking with local error, we can now point at a cell in memory and ask how much error does it have and what instructions contributed to that error. So this solves two of the problems that we run into, that floating point errors are silent, and that it's hard to identify the root cause of inaccuracies. But we also need to com find context to describe the computation tree, uh, to say, here are how the inputs were computed such that this is an inaccurate computation. And to do that, 
we use a subsystem that tracks the entire concrete arithmetic expression tree that computed a value. So every time you do an operation, we also record that as an expression tree. And that lets us point to a cell in memory that we think is inaccurate, say, and ask, okay, what computations led us to this point? Now, on its own, these are concrete expression trees, so you think of these as a tree of depth 10 or 20,000, however long your program's been running, that describe everything that's ever happened in your program. Giving these to the user would not be super useful. It's too much information. So what we do is we abstract from these concrete expressions into abstract expressions where we replace some of the subtrees with variables. And we do that using an algorithm from the pattern matching literature called anti-unification, which is basically gonna take these concrete expression trees and come up with a most specific generalization of them. And so between these three subsystems, we've now solved the three problems that we identified as you know, making it difficult to debug floating point programs. And these also give us the output that Herbgrind can produce for the user. So Herbgrind can show the user the error of each of their program outputs, anything that's printed to the screen or anything that's used to make a branch. And for each of those outputs, the high local error operations that contributed to that error. And furthermore, for each of these operations, we can show what expressions they were computing. So this gives context that you can use to actually solve uh, whatever floating point problem you've identified. Now this is a little abstract, so I wanna make it more concrete by doing a demo. And uh, in order to avoid switching laptops, I recorded the demo earlier this morning. <laughs> so this is, this is hot off the presses. And what I'm gonna do in this demo is start with a program that I've written on the left here. So you can see that it uses the formula you will find on Wikipedia for the quadratic formula. And it's gonna call this with a sequence of inputs where the parameter B is increasing by a factor of 10, from 10 to the negative 10th to 10 to the 10th. Maybe with an off by one somewhere. So <laughs> uh, if we take the C code, we compile it and run it. And here I'm compiling with dash O zero, uh, not because you need that for Herbrand to work, uh, but because otherwise BCC would pre-compute all the answers and the program it produced would just call printf with some strings. <laughs> so uh, we compile the program and we run it. And you see that the output has two weird things. First of all, there's a bunch of NANDs. And second of all, more subtly, these last two outputs are zero. But uh, if you look at the pattern, that we're getting over here, you sort of suspect this one should be negative three times 10th negative ninth and the same times 10th negative 10th. So something fishy is going on there as well. And in, in fact, that, that is the cause of some cancellation and some underflow that's coming up here. So we're going to want to take this program and run it under Herbgrind to see what Herbgrind can tell us about it. So we run Herbgrind, it runs directly on the compiled binary and it just runs the binary under Valgrind and stores an output file describing what it's found. So the output file looks like this. And you can see basically that we have one program output which it calls result up here. And that's on line 13. So that's that solve quadratic call passed to the printf. And it's computed the average and maximum error for that computation. Now, these are kind of weird numbers. So the maximum error of 64 bits is the difference between outputting NAN and outputting like an actual number, assuming that the answer is an actual number. Uh, and the 47.75 uh, is largely the result of averaging some number of NANs and some number of things that are kind of close to NAN when it's outputting zero instead of like a normal number. <laughs> you can see that it thought that this line of code executed 20 times which makes sense, uh, given that that's how many times this loop executes. And that this expression comes from a single high local error operation. And the operation it cares about here is this division that comes from over there. So it's produced this output in this S expression based format called FP core, which if you want to learn more about, you should go to Zach's talk later today. And you can see that for this high local error operation, it's also given the average uh, local error and the maximum local error. 
So this is the output that you get with Herbgrind. Uh, and with a small program like this, uh, the output is about as long as the program itself. But we've also run this on hundreds of thousands of line long programs that do things like molecular dynamics computations where you do get a significantly reduced part of the program that you actually need to look at. Cool. Now, this input might not seem as useful as you'd like for a non-expert user because you may be wondering what exactly is a non-expert user supposed to do starting from this point. And this is where I'm gonna to transition to talking about a second project that we worked on. Yeah? Before you go there, one question. Um, how much overhead roughly does this need to do? Yeah, like a lot. <laughs> can be <laughs> that. So, uh, Are we talking factors 10 or factors 1,000? Okay, so this runs, in, this runs in Valgrind. So Valgrind already has a factor of 10. So it's more like a factor of 1,000. Uh, and, you know, uh, this is due mostly to keeping in track this higher precision operation. So, uh, in, you know, our paper we have some pretty detailed comparisons of like how much of the time is spent on doing higher precision computation. If you tell it to use fewer bits, how does the answer change? I mean, mostly we identify fewer problems because we miss some of them, but it goes a lot faster. Um, okay, so, uh, now let's, let me talk about Herbie, which is basically the answer to the question of what do you do now. So to show that, I'm gonna open up uh, the shell again and start up Herbie. And Herbie, being a tool to improve the accuracy of floating point expressions, ought to be able to take us from this point to a more accurate computation that we could sub in for this solved quadratic call. So I'm gonna copy and paste the output of Herbgrind into Herbie. And it'll take about a minute. What it's doing over this minute is a heuristic search, so no guarantees, uh, for variant ways to do this computation, some of which might be more accurate. And what it's gonna come up with as a mo in a moment is a combination of two of those that cover the input range well enough to be useful. So uh, in a moment this will come back. I don't remember actually how long this took, but I think it's about a minute. Uh, and, you know, naturally the time is spent on, I think it evaluates something on the order of 1,000 or 10,000 candidates before coming up with this one. So I'm going to take this, which <laughs> looks even worse, right, uh, and compile it to C. So these are using some of the standard tools that Zach will talk about in his talk, which gives me this function. And, you know, note that, actually, interestingly, this function is a little different from the solved quadratic we started with because in our solved quadratic call, we never varied A or C. And so Herb Grant didn't pick those up as variables. Um, and therefore, this function actually has only one input. So when we copy this in, we're gonna want to change this solved quadratic call with three parameters to calling that function with a single parameter. And if we go back, compile that function, and run it, we'll see that we have largely resolved that inaccuracy that we saw before. Um, what I mean is, he, here it's, it's introducing a branch, for example, and I mean, it, don't it, want to introduce a branch because there's some vectorization happening somewhere. Uh, we are also like adding a lot of uh, divisions, yep. versions, so maybe there's some performance penalties. Yep. We are yep. also introducing a branch, so maybe it's going to introduce a, a discontinuity in the transition. Yeah, those are all great questions. So uh, hold those for a moment. And uh, in, when I get into talking about how Herbie itself works, uh, I'll be able to give better answers to how we deal with those. But we avoid taking a square root. <laughs> that is true. Uh, so in actually a lot of cases, Herbie's output is faster because you don't have to call into special functions. Um, for, for some of the lines, the output now is less precise than it used to be, right? I see a minus five times 10 to the three where I thought I mean, since yes. there wasn't should be minus three everywhere. Um, I don't know exactly which answer is more correct. This is, you know, one of those fun things, right? <laughs> like, actually, I don't have a better way of computing this than asking the computer. Uh, so I don't know if that's true. Okay. It seems uh, like it's actually a discontinuity of the branch. It may be discontinuous uh, there. But then which because, the, because it's like seven and nine, it's, it's, it appears clearly when, when x or one seven, or one ten seven. Okay, so that's a good question. I unfortunately can't answer it. Uh, 
But I assume it doesn't actually give you an explanation. No. I mean, it, it gives you an explanation, but it can't tell you, like, why it thinks this is more accurate because its answer is, like, I tried a bunch of stuff and okay. this worked fairly well. I just mean as a user of this, right, if I saw that branch, I'd say, uh, yeah. no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, this is, this is uh, part of where this decision to work for non-expert users comes in. Right, uh, if you have the expertise to say that, you might also have the expertise to do a better job than we're doing. I think someone on Twitter described Herbie as having a drunk numerical analyst look at your code. <laughs> uh, so let me talk a bit about how Herbie works, and to do that, I will switch to a different slide deck. So our goal with Herbie is to automatically do these sorts of transformations. Uh, this one's a bit of a more complicated one uh, than the one Herbie did for you just a moment ago, uh, only because we're looking at a broader range of b-values. So you can see that in this case too, we're gonna to come up with a wide variety of different expressions for different types of problems, for solving cancellation or overflows, as the case may be. So we wanna do this sort of transformation automatically. And we're gonna do it roughly using a, okay, I'm actually gonna skip this in the interest of time, but they are cool pictures. Uh, so, uh, so Herbie's gonna do this sort of automatic transformation largely using a generate and test mechanism. So we're going to compute ground truth values, then find new ways of computing the same expression, and then keep them if they're more accurate. And at the end of the day, we're gonna put all the best ones we found together into a single one by inferring a branch. So let's start with the sampling. Herbie uses random input values to figure out what, ex what uh, the accuracy of the expression it's received is. So it's going to sample those input values. Using random input values, we can easily compute the floating point version of that computation, but it's a little harder to get these exact results. Uh, because as you pointed out before, you know, even using MPFR, which is what uh, Herbie's gonna use internally, it's a little hard to know what precision you want to evaluate that at. And at what point are you evaluating in high enough precision that you've gotten the real answer? So in Herbie, we have this heuristic method of trying successively higher precisions until the answer stops changing. Uh, and we found that this works fairly well. So for example, it gets you the same answer as using 64,000 bits. Uh, and if 64,000 bits isn't enough, then I suppose we've got other problems. So uh, using this, we can compute the 64-bit rounded versions that we get from using higher precision throughout um, and increasing the precision until things stop changing. So that's our method for getting these exact results. And if we have exact and floating point results, we can look at the difference between the two. And that's gonna be a measure of how accurate any particular expression we're looking at is. And we're gonna save these exact results so that we don't have to recompute them throughout the search process. So now that we have a ground truth to compare candidates to, we're gonna to want to start generating candidate expressions. And here the main challenge in Herbie is dealing with the explosion in search space. There are lots of ways to compute any given floating point expression and we can't try them all because it would take too long. So the first step in this generating process is actually to focus on individual operations that cause that error. And in Herbie we're gonna do that using the local error uh, heuristic that I talked about earlier. So you can think of any computation as this abstract syntax tree and we're just gonna start at leaves and compute ex approximate and exact values and use that same local error computation use the same local error computation from the exact and approximate values of the children. So we can continue that same uh, operation all the way up the tree until we identify individual operations that have a significant amount of local error. So again, we're using local error to take a large computation and focus on individual operations that cause a lot of that eventual end-to-end -end error. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, so of all these operations, we're gonna want to pick the one with the highest local error, and that operation is gonna be the one that we focus our attempts at rewriting and changing the uh, formula at. So once we have that location, our first way of generating new ways of computing the same formula is with a collection of rewrite rules. So you can think of the rewrite rules that we're using as something like an axiomatization of arithmetic. So uh, these are all standard things. They're not numerical methods specific. You will find them at the back of most high school textbooks. Uh, and what Herbie's gonna do is blindly attempt to take any of these rules 
that match this operator and apply them by matching on the bound variables and outputting those bound variables in the appropriate places on the right-hand side of the rule. And not only can we, Herbie do this to a single rule, but it can also do this recursively to a sequence of rules. So Herbie is actually going to come up with quite a lot of different program variants. Some of those will be quite silly, like this one, which flips the order of that addition, and others will be more useful, like the different squares trick that Herbie pulled out. Now, on its own, some of these expressions are pretty nasty looking. You don't really want to compute this. And in fact, it's not more accurate than the left-hand side. So to handle that problem, we're going to want to use a simplification pass. So the idea of simplification is that we want to go from this, which is no more accurate than where we started and also pretty ugly looking, and do a sequence of relatively small computation and simplification steps to get us down to this. So now this output formula is in fact more accurate than the input on certain input values. And this is not as easy as it looks because there's a huge search space and we also want to make sure not to undo the progress that we did a moment ago. So a bad simplification would be to say that this is a different difference of squares and we can cancel. Uh, that would be taking us back to where we started. So this is a pretty tricky problem. We approached it using a technique from the compiler's literature. It was called equivalence graphs. So this was a way of storing uh, intersimplifiable formulas together so that we can represent an exponentially sized search space of all the possible ways of rewriting these with small steps into a polynomial sized data structure. And from that, we can pluck the smallest AST as some approximation of the simplest AST. And we're going to be doing that with a restricted set of rewrites so that we can't do, undo the useful progress that we've just done. So that's one way of generating better, uh, or at least different, uh, ways of computing a floating point formula. And another way that Herbie likes to use is series expansion. So here the idea is that for some problems, like for example, uh, if this b squared overflows, there's no way to easily rewrite the formula into some algebraically equivalent formula uh, that avoids that problem. So instead what we'd like to do is, you might think of them as approximate rewrite rules. So for example, if b is very large, which is where this overflow would occur, then we'd like to use this approximate rewrite rule that the square root of one minus x is one minus x over two. Obviously not always true, but it is true for small x's, which for large b this will be. So if we apply that rewrite rule, we can then simplify to get a formula that will be accurate on those particular input values. And so uh, to do this, we use uh, partial Laurent series. Uh, so that's the, the type of series we use, and we have our own series expander to determine how many terms of the series expansion you need to take, um, and that can expand around zero, around infinity, or around a particular point that has high error. Okay, so this is a second way that Herbie can generate other formulas that compute the same thing. So this is unsound, right? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, totally. I mean, whatever your meaning of soundness is, this one isn't it. No, no, just in terms <laughs> of real arithmetic, this is unsound. Yeah, definitely. So what- In other terms, too. <laughs> Sorry? And in other ways, too. Uh, the whole goal here, right, is we're focusing on users for whom soundness is far beyond their capabilities. They would like their program but to you just give back a constant answer. I mean, uh, what I'm trying to understand is, you know, when is a result that you produce a good result? Yeah, that's a great question. And our goal here is that we want the output of your floating point computation to be as close as possible to the, the output you would get if you did the entire computation in the reals. And in that regard, these series expansions, even though they don't maintain the you know, equivalence of the formulas, can still be quite accurate on certain input ranges. Uh, just to build on that a little bit, maintaining real equivalence also doesn't provide any guarantee of soundness. So just because the rewrites you do have some meaning in the reals, that doesn't mean anything in terms of the floats. You can have two real equivalent expressions that are arbitrarily different over floats. Anyway, so I, I know this question of soundness is quite important, uh, but I don't think we can explicate it here. Uh, so let's, let's take the rest of that discussion offline. My, my worry is that when you applied this uh, series expansion, you kept A and C to be variables. So I could have something where 
you know, A and C are both equal to B in your previous slide. So there is no real solution, but you will happily give me back a real solution, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, these. So what under what notion is your is your uh, closeness preserved? So uh, you're, you're asking a question about, you know, what is the space of inputs that we consider? And that is a key question, right? In Herbie, we answer that we use sampling. So we're sort of implicitly assuming that we don't know anything about the input values. And that assumption is particularly useful for library authors who really don't know that much about their input values. Uh, but, you know, depending on your use, there's definitely room there to make alternate assumptions. We're also okay with producing non-NAN answers for NANs. In some sense, you shouldn't have called the operation with those inputs in the first place. Sure. Okay, so the other uh, point that comes up is that a lot of these rewrites might be accurate on some inputs, but not others. And uh, at the end of this rewrite loop, where we're constantly trying to change the programs we produce, we're gonna have a series of candidates, some of which are good on some inputs, some of which are good on others. And to combine them together, we're gonna use this process that we call regime inference. So you can visualize this by imagining that we have our candidates and we're gonna overlap their error graphs. So from this overlap error graph where this axis is the B axis, we can walk along the axis and for each point pick out which formula is gonna produce the most accurate output. And these breakpoints that we find are giving us some tests that we can use to determine which of the candidate solutions we want to evaluate for which point. Uh, so this is the process we use for combining these multiple input values into a single whole. So this is where the branch came This is where that branch came from. So, you know, uh, why did it pick the branch value it chose? Uh, it's gonna be somewhat dependent on the input values it chose, but largely de de dependent on finding the point where the error graph of one intersects the error graph of the other. Do you further use the information from these regimes to order the conditionals, or how do you now decide where to place which in the final code. Right, so uh, on Herbie, we mostly think of ourselves as operating at a like higher level abstraction than that. So we don't put any intelligence into ordering these branches. Uh, and you know, you saw in the demo that I was manually copying and pasting the code and had to change a few things to call the new code. Right, and this sort of integration work is something that we don't imagine would be easy to do automatically. But we're hoping that you know, the users that we're imagining might not be experts in numerical methods, but they do know how to edit software and you know, change the code to call this new function. So we're hoping some of that integration work they can do themselves. And that might involve reordering these methods. And I have a quick question, I may have missed this. Uh, are all the functions you're optimizing over univariate, or can they take multiple inputs? Multiple variables is okay. So uh, this one, for example, takes A, B, and C as parameters. Yes, but in the optimization, you only talk about values of B here. Yeah, so there's, there's room to make this smarter. Uh, the way we chose B is that Herbie will try A, B, and C as axes and pick the one that it did best with. Uh, but there is room to do something other than splitting on a single B variable. And that's something we've looked into, uh, but don't have great answers to yet. That's a, just a more challenging question, doing this you know, inference for multi-dimensional spaces. There's a branch that does arbitrary expressions right now. Yeah, but I don't think it's very smart. I agree. Okay. Uh, how big is the sampling you're doing here? Uh, I think it's a thousand points or two thousand points, something like that. So naturally sampling also means we are just unable to give you guarantees about that this is more accurate. We're keeping that in mind as a goal, but it's not something that the process itself is capable of proving. So when you do serial expansion, you kind of already know that this will only be accurate in a particular range. Do you yeah. use that to inform the read? The, the, the read? That would be smart, uh, but we found that doesn't really help that much. Uh, and mostly the reason is that, you know, whatever we're doing a series expansion around, uh, we'll recover that information when we do it here. Uh, and as we do this, we can also take into, in, into account uh, information that we didn't come up with like this. So uh, for example, between determining between these two, neither of which is the result of a series expansion is something we're gonna have to do anyway. But, but this means there's a slight chance that you do this, this transformation which changes the value in the real, it's the series expansion, and then you actually end up using it in a regime where it's completely inaccurate, but you just don't have to have an assembly there. 
Right. Uh, so that that is a is a reasonable concern, um, and you know uh, the same concerns come up with algebraically equivalent rewrites like these, where you might still be using it in a region where it's incredibly inaccurate due to a lack of a sample. So those are that's okay, just sort so of I'm par for the course with using samples. I find that that's concerning. <laughs> you shouldn't. <laughs> I mean, you get the wrong answer either way. Uh, so whatever the reason for getting the wrong answer, I think uh, it. It seems aesthetically less pleasing to do it because you did a series expansion and then forgot. Uh, but ultimately, we 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 find that you know, if your goal is to create the most accurate program that you can, uh, remembering that information about the series expansion doesn't help that much. Okay, so uh, I would like to, in the interest of time, cover some, but not all of the lessons learned that I had saved here. And you know, uh, we can talk about some of those offline if you're interested. So I wanna talk about just this section, uh, which is some of the questions that we've consistently run up against when we go from a sort of high level understanding of what these tools ought to do to attempting to implement them for real world programs, which you know, involve weird stuff and binaries and so on. So I, I wanted to draw out three particular questions that we find ourselves re returning to in these tools. And the first of these questions is handling layers of abstraction. So most software and numerical software among it is written as layers upon layers of user code, then libraries that build on libraries that build on system libraries, and at the bottom are gonna be weird compiler uh, choices for implementations. So for example, this is how GCC sometimes negates floating point numbers. Uh, so with these multiple levels of abstraction, there's basically two questions uh, that we find ourselves uh, constantly having to answer. The first is how do we detect that some low level sequence of instructions is actually a higher level concept? So how do we detect, for example, that your weird combination of XORs and subtractions and additions is really just the best approximation you can do to say a sine or a cosine? And then the dual to that question, which is if you have an expression the higher level notions, at what point do you need to peer through this abstraction of sign and muddle around with its insides to get a more accurate answer overall? And these come up for library functions like sine and cosine, for higher level libraries like vector and matrix math, and they also come up with these weird idioms that you find in binaries where the compiler has decided to do something clever and you have to back that out to get a good understanding of what's going on floating point wise. Couldn't you get at least rid of these idioms in the, com in the binaries by just using closer? Because that would give you a semantic preservation. You were saying that what you have on the high level for the floating points just for the Well, so this also preserves semantics, right? If you understand the floating points. But it's hard for you to analyze. So sure. Then uh, so I think, you know, uh, the question that comes up is not so much that, you know, we break our heads trying to figure out how this works, which we sometimes do, uh, but that the tool also needs to view every negation in sort of dual vision, right? First as a negation, but second as this sort of weird low level trick. Uh, because either view might become valuable at either point in time. Similarly, you know, if you're looking at, for example, this complex subtraction, do you want to look at it as two separate subtractions? Because maybe you can do something to one but not the other, and that'll make your result accurate. Or do you want to leave it as is and try to manipulate something on the higher level to make the result accurate? So that sort of dual vision we've had as a consistent challenge with numerical software. Another challenge that we continuously come upon is the relationship between floating point and integer computations. <coughs> On the one hand, it's really important to separate these because even what we would think of as a numerical program, like, uh, I don't know, a, like an optimization routine or a, or a control software, is actually gonna have a lot of non-floating point computation in it. It's gonna have control flow, which is gonna involve mostly booleans and integers. <laughs> it's going to set up and tear down data. It'll probably read from disk. And all of those are gonna show up as integer computations that we don't care about and would prefer to ignore. On the other hand, large numerical programs also have integers that are secretly real numbers, so fixed points. And it's also gonna have some floating point numbers that are secretly integers, like someone has a loop counter that's in floating point when maybe it shouldn't be in floating point. So, Separating the floating point and the integer world is continuously a concern for us in Herbgrind and is also becoming a concern for us in Herbie where we'd like to take the separation into account as well. 
And we find that basically the question is always how to analyze conversions between the two worlds. And a third challenge that we consistently find ourselves answering is, of course, performance. So uh, both Herbie and Herbgrind were using a lot of these classic performance techniques, like sharing, whether that's sharing shadow values in Herbgrind uh, to save on memory or to save on time, or we're talking about sharing equivalence classes information in Herbie to make simplification fast. And you know, these classic techniques like sharing, laziness, incrementalization uh, are something we're continuously having to implement to make our tools at all usable by any users. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned, I want to skip this last section where I mention some of these bag of tricks tools that we've had to recourse to every now and then in our work. So if you're interested in those, you can feel free to ask in a moment. Uh, and also feel free to ask about some of the work we're hoping to do in the future, which is uh, supporting multiple types in Herbie. Uh, so having Herbie produce, for example, matrix or vector operations, double-double operations for you and also support for loops and higher level libraries. Uh, so if you have questions about any of those, I'd like to hear them. And so thank you for listening and I'd, I'd love to answer any questions you've got.